Well, uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, boys and girls, and ladies and gentlemen. Well, this is a great effort of uh, IACTA and ICCA, and in particular, uh, Dr. Rahul Guho Biswas, uh, that uh, this is really, it, he has given wings to this program and uh, with uh, all this technology of Zoom and all, uh, in fact, we can reach people at uh, all the nooks and corners of uh, our country, uh, even beyond, and people can uh, really interact and learn a lot. It's good, I think every street has a shady side, so Corona has given this kind of thing by which we can carry on this uh, teaching activity throughout the year. So uh, thanks again to Rahul and also uh, Manoj from ACTA office for uh, doing the job at back end. Well, this, thank you, uh, sir. Thank yeah, you. This session, uh, we uh, talk about some uh, uh, basics of myocardial protection we all do clinically. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we will uh, just learn that why actually myocardial protection is important, what actually it means. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, if uh, whenever we offer cardiac surgery to a person and then uh, we have to operate on the heart and uh, we might have to open it up. And uh, uh, so when you are operating on the heart, it has to stop. That is uh, uh, what's uh, important. Uh, when you are opening the chambers and well, in, in the last three, four decades, uh, they have also do started doing many operations on the beating hearts. But it's still, uh, whenever the heart is not perfusing or not perfusing at the, those normal, what we call as normal uh, circulatory pressures that can maintain coronary perfusion, then the thing is that we have to actually uh, preserve this myocardium somehow or the other. Uh, so many, many uh, 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 functions you have seen during the surgery that uh, uh, you don't want to let the heart distant, you want to cool the heart and you want to vent the various cavities so that it doesn't bulge out and it actually preserves itself. But what is, uh, when you want to stop the heart, then uh, how it is done, then it is uh, certain solutions and all that uh, are given, or you cool the patient to maybe deep uh, hypothermia when automatically the heart stops because of hypothermia. But we know that uh, that is a very crazy procedure and it uh, involves lots of damage to the myocardium. So the point is, uh, uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. oh, it's coming. So uh, whenever uh, we talk about myocardial preservation during surgery, uh, most of the times uh, we are concerned about the ATPs, means the energy, uh, the energy which is readily available uh, for its functioning and uh, also to preserve the structure of the uh, myocardial cell. You know that cell is a living organism and uh, it needs energy to remain intact. And that is very important that uh, whatever you do, if the myocardial cell remains intact, it will take the load itself when you are off pump and uh, the heart starts on its own. When you open the heart, and you want to actually uh, make the heart still, then actually the most important points are that if you want to arrest the heart, then it has to be done quickly. Because when you are doing a quick arrest, then actually you conserve lots of uh, energy bonds in the form of ATPs. And during the arrested phase, you minimize the energy requirement. Only that much is needed which is uh, essential for the structural uh, uh, integrity of the myocardial cells. And uh, you also don't want to uh, damage myocardial cells a lot. 
because that will affect the post-operative function. And then there is something called a reperfusion. It happens in the whole human body. Reperfusion means if you stop circulation or the blood flow in that organ, in that capillary network, in that heart for some time, and when you restore it, it looks to be, grossly speaking, uh, it looks to be, you might have seen that whenever a surgeon opens a conduit to the coronaries, that area becomes pink. We call it, oh, the blush is fine. Uh, grossly, it looks to be perfect. But actually at the cellular level, uh, something totally opposite is happening at that moment of time. And that is actually, it took a while for people to understand that uh, it is not only cessation of uh, circulation, right? Means creating ischemia, that causes problem. But when you actually open up the circulation, then also you find that uh, still danger is not far away. In fact, many a times the danger is so obvious, so strong, uh, and many a times it becomes very difficult to manage. It may end up with so many things, arrhythmias and uh, uh, heart chambers swelling up, not performing well, heart staying in lower output syndrome, and then you need lots of drugs and support for this part. So that is because of the repercussions. So it is all energy related things. Now, if you look at the oxygen consumption of the heart, I have made this uh, table for you. Compare between the arrested heart, many a times you just empty the heart into the pump, uh, support it by pump and let the heart beating, and also at the fibrillating heart. You see, uh, it is very surprising that empty beating to the sinus rhythm, right, and the fibrillating heart, they all have a similar kind of oxygen consumption, right? And it is very near to your normal beating and functioning heart, which takes around 10 mils of 500 grams per minute, right? And also I have added the hypothermic conditions. You can very well see here that even in extreme hypothermia, beating empty heart and fibrillating heart, they still have uh, lots of oxygen consumption. Grossly, you may think that if it, heart doesn't need oxygen at that level, but it, uh, it is there, right? So it is because of the enzymatic activity that is going on. But if you look at the arrested heart, it's a very significant reduction in oxygen requirement. So the mechanical activity of the heart, if you stop that, then you will have the maximum uh, a reduction in oxygen requirement and whatever is available at that point of time, that will be very uh, efficiently used by the heart muscles for, the, for maintenance of all the enzymatic systems and the organelles inside the cell so that they don't get disrupted, especially the mitochondria, sarcoplasmic reticulum and all that. So cardioplegia means some solution, uh, ionic solution. That is what's important to actually stop and uh, fulfill those four principles for the preservation of myocardium. Now, uh, how, how people started playing with potassium? Actually, it was Walter Herman Nernst in 1881 who gave this equation, Nernst equation. Actually, across the membranes and all, if you want to look at the potential difference, then this equation comes into play and you can very well calculate. So like in the myocardial cell membrane potential, if you look at, right, then you can very well see a, that the equilibrium potential across the vessel is actually a function of right? Those defining ions inside and outside. 
So if you look at the membrane potential of myocardium, and we know that potassium is mainly an ion which stays inside the cell, and outside it is probably four uh, milliequivalents uh, per 100 mils of uh, concentration, but uh, it is more inside. So you can very well see here that uh, by putting and playing this uh, uh, equation, the resting membrane potential will come to around minus 90. Now, if you do an experiment, you actually, what you do is you increase the potassium concentration outside the myocardial cell, right? Supposing we did, like we, when we give cardioplegia, from four to 20 milliequivalents, supposing we increase that. Then what will happen that this resting membrane potential will come up from minus 90 to around minus 70 or 60, right? Or rather, yes, 60 or something like that. So when the membrane potential is at that level, then we all know that the depolarization cannot be initiated because uh, of, uh, I'll tell you why, why it will not be initiated. So what we learned by this equation, that if we are thinking about using a solution, an ionic solution to stop an electrically initiated action potential, that causes myocardial contractility. If we want to stop it, then we have to switch off the current, means current across the various channels, right? So the action potentials means that has to be stopped and that can be done by manipulating, right? Inside the cell, directly you cannot manipulate because that will be dependent on the extracellular matrix in which the myocardial cells are lying. So we can very well change with the extra cellular fluid in which these myocytes are bathed. And we can, res uh, we can actually initiate the stoppage of the propagation of this action potential. And you can stop the uh, muscle cell from mechanically working, right? So this is just for your uh, uh, review, that this is the major ions, sodium, potassium, and calcium. That is the levels inside and outside the myocardial cell. So as I said, this is the action potential of a cardiac my, uh, muscle. It is different from your action potential, what is it starts or generates at the sinus node. Uh, Right, but we because we are talking about the cells, so we talk here, and you can very well see that it is the minus 90 that is the resting potential, right? And when there is any kind of stimulus changes in ions and all that, then it opens the potassium channels, right, and the calcium channels, and there is a fast, rapid sodium movement. Now, this thing starts. This rapid sodium influx actually starts not at 90, not at 50, but at around 70 something. So minus 70, if it reaches from 90 to minus 70, then because of this potassium rectifier channels, then the suddenly sodium channels open. There is a deluge of sodium ions inside the cell, right? And the action potential starts. There is depolarization. Right. And gradually there is a phase of one, phase two, in which the calcium channels come into play, slow calcium channels, the influx is there. And then there is a phase three, all right, of depolarization, okay, in which the calcium channels, some of those uh, remain open, but most of them close. And again, rectifier potassium channels remain open, you see. Okay, so what happens is if you are, if the potassium, this cell is lying in a broth of high potassium content, you will find that this is arrested here. From here, I have plot these two lines. 
that you arrest it here at around minus 50 millivolts, that remains the extension potential and it gets prolonged up to like that. It never reaches this nadir of minus 90, right? So your cell remains depolarized and no, uh, it will not initiate any activity, it will not contract. So that is there. That is what happens when you give a hyperkalemic which is very commonly used most of the times in our clinical practice in all the phases that uh, we use hyperkalemia. So this is how this potassium acts, right? And keeps the heart or the myocyte silent. Not means, silent means the, uh, it is structurally viable, but mechanically it is not acting. It is not contracting or relaxing. It is uh, stuck in that phase. The other thing you may ask that, well, you, I talked about deep, sorry, it is deep polarizing. I don't know, means some, one R is missing. Uh, so uh, you can very well see here that then you can ask, you can say that, well, can we stuck it somewhere here also? You say that deep polarizing phase, it is stuck. Can we say before when it is hyperpolarized, can we do it? Yes. Uh, uh, science has looked into it. They have done lots of animal studies, right? And they have done few uh, uh, human studies as well. See, the point is, why, what's the difference between if we go to the polarizing or hyperpolarizing fluid, not hyperkalemic depolarizing fluid, right? Uh, so uh, why? Because we saw that still sodium and calcium loading can occur in even in phase three, right by window currents. There are many different kinds of channels. And now this will actually, because you see your muscle is lying quiet, but because of these, the inside, the inside milieu of the cell is being loaded with calcium. Remember calcium is one ion which brings out all the activity of the heart. Contraction is coupled by calcium but this is also a rogue ion. If you leave it for some time and leave it without activity or without regulating it, then it may cause problems also. So calcium, if it is lying, it is increasing in concentration inside the cell. Then once you start reperfusing the heart, this loaded calcium inside the cell will again create problems, okay? So it will actually increase the injury, right? And limiting the safe storage duration. You may think that you are storing because your heart is not moving, but actually heart, if you look at the cell, it is getting loaded with calcium and it is actually uh, crossing limits in which the injury will start. It is ready, it is sitting at that point so that it may get injured once reperfusion occurs, right? And supposing if we use a polarizing, hyperpolarizing solution, you see, to actually resting EM, it actually reduces the ionic movement because you see at the phase zero, there is minimal ionic movements. So probably it will improve post ischemic recovery by looking at the, when we understand the various pathways, either those pathways which are causing apoptosis or those pathways in which it is a direct uh, necrotic injury, right? So those pathways could be improved. And this hyperpolarized, actually people try to look at, not by increasing, but by, uh, by ATP sensitive potassium channel openers so that they may actually bring about the changes in potassium across the membrane faster. And you can see here, this is a very uh, commonly used St. Thomas solution. I, I, I took it from AS. I, I never knew, you see, if you put an A before S, then uh, it makes a very competent uh, uh, means uh, researcher. Uh, it was an eye-opening for me. So from this journal, I have taken it. And you can see here 
that it is St. Thomas, right, a polarizing and St. Thomas uh, depolarizing theory. People have tried to make it. That is the difference in that, right? And they have used esmolol, adenosine, and magnesium as three important compounds to hyperpolarize the myocardial cell instead of using uh, potassium, right? Look here, potassium is more in a depolarizing St. Thomas solution as compared to the hyperpolarizing St. Thomas solution. But because it will add to the cost, still we don't know how to handle these solutions properly. And so there is enormous experience with depolarizing solutions, easy to use. And uh, we know now that how often if you can infuse these, the amount, the quantity, and uh, add it with some hypothermia, then it will do the same kind of good work as uh, this one. So still it remains not to be used so often. Again, in this cartoon, you can very well see here, they have actually explained how hyperpolarization works. So this is actually the potassium channels which open up. These are the actually endothelial uh, relaxation factors. And uh, this is a hyperpolarization factor. These factors are proteins which are available inside the endothelial cells. That's how they work, a balance is maintained. And if you look at these, means the hyperpolarizing solutions, you can see here that the calcium levels go down and vasorelaxation occurs into the smooth muscles, into the vascular uh, uh, vessels, in the coronary vessels and all that, all right? So that is there. If it is depolarization, you can very well see that hyperpolarization is actually does not occur and it has its own quota problem. So that is how actually this hyperpolarization works. So after understanding the mechanism at the molecular level, that what actually we want to achieve, what is the uh, ionic uh, uh, mathematics uh, at that level, then we come to the characteristics of the solutions which are available. Well, both kinds of solutions means mimicking extracellular and mimicking intracellular because you see these solutions have come up. Uh, you may find many names, right? And you will see that actually it is the last 20, 30, 40 years that gradually things are being added up, things are being taken out from these solutions depending on the experience from one group to the other and all that. But the main, the crux point is everybody wants to actually uh, preserve the myocardium as much and as long as possible uh, so that the post-operative outcome is better. So those mimic extracellular composition, right? They have some calcium and sodium present. The simpler to control equilibration characteristics within the ischemic myocardial tissue. But the disadvantage is that they are readily washed out by non-coronary flow. You must have heard many times say, oh, heart is not actually stopping because we have lots of collateral flow. So that is the heart, is, uh, the, the flows are returning uh, from these circuits and they are actually increasing the temperature of the myocardium. They are actually changing the extracellular composition. And those where you, it mimics intracellular composition, they lack sodium and calcium, right? They have uh, a lot of potassium in it. And uh, uh, so that way what happens that uh, they can actually have so, uh, lots of space in which you can add some other additives in this cardiology, this cardioplegic solution in form of amino acids and found of other, uh, uh, other additives, which you think or by research you found that actually these may be probably helpful in preserving the myocardial cell further. So that is space is available if you just don't add sodium, calcium. Uh, they, they actually restrict ischemia induced calcium entry, predispose the heart to elicit calcium paradox. That is the problem if they have intracellular composition and there is a complex pattern of subsequent re-equilibration. Re-equilibration means the sending the rest, the, your myocardial cell, muscle cell, to that state that was before you started uh, stopping the heart, taking him to the, him to the surgery, 
uh, means what it was normally present beforehand. That is what the recalibration is. Now I said additives means uh, you can have space for various additives. The biggest additive you know, cardioplegia started with crystalloids. And then uh, when uh, Bug Bug came up with the, that, why can't we use blood? Because blood had so many things and uh, it, is, it is something in which all the cells are bathed. They know blood very much by heart and soul, uh, only giving crystalloid, uh, probably that will swell up the cells. Uh, so the blood, and then uh, of course, insulin, glucose, because uh, lidocaine, procaine, as membrane stabilizes aspartate glutamate so that they can actually uh, work into various enzymatic uh, processes right and they may they may feed they may actually be used uh, for atp processes and the pathways uh, calcium i will uh, i will say that the calcium you see is, as i said that it, calcium you can ask well calcium is problematic but uh, totally absence of calcium again is problematic. Magnesium to take care of calcium. It is also a membrane stabilizer. Nitroglycerin, well, it may give some nitrate. You know, one of the uh, one of the uh, this uh, uh, endothelial relaxation molecule is nitric oxide, and nitroglycerin is a donor of nitric oxide. So, uh, if you add that, then will that help? Uh, well, there are studies, they say that uh, uh, it, it may be effective, it may not be effective, uh, because they also uh, get uh, ameliorated fast, they get metabolized fast, so we don't know. Superoxide dismutase, because you know that a reperfusion also brings in lots of oxygen, uh, so, uh, and then oxygen-free radicals are produced, and these are the uh, enzymes which work on those and try to actually lim limit uh, the these free radicals that are really very high reactive species and cause lots of cell damage. Now quickly, uh, we have understood a lot on the basis of the myocardial preservation. Now we, uh, the second part, quickly go through some of the solutions. I'll not uh, actually show you all the solutions and all. You can actually fathom the internet you can find lots. This is the commonest which we use, St. Thomas solution with crystallite. Uh, it, is, it was made in Ringel lactate solution. That was the base solution on which the, this was, uh, these uh, were added. And you can see here, the main ingredient is it is a hyperkalemic solution. Uh, so uh, it was there for depolarizing thing. Osmolality is nearly plasma and pH is uh, uh, not too bad so that uh, we can use it. Now, as I said, that bug bug uh, started looking into the blood, that why blood cannot be used. And then it has come up from there, his works and uh, his uh, one or two papers. Uh, uh, you can, I, I, uh, I suggest that you must read these uh, classical works, you know, in which uh, they have come out with uh, these blood. Uh, now I can't just uh, go on. Uh, on this lecture, otherwise we will miss our dinner. Uh, four is to one is the blood uh, crystalloid composition, which you must have seen your uh, perfusionist delivering to the heart. Uh, four times blood, one time uh, crystalloid, which is uh, the solution of St. Thomas or other solutions and all. But though commonly we use St. Thomas solution. So four is to one, uh, four times blood, one is the, uh, that uh, solution. And uh, why? Because blood gives natural buffering, uh, natural oncotic pressure, uh, oxygen delivery may be there because uh, you know when uh, hemoglobin is the best vehicle, it knows how to deliver if there is some uh, something. But you know that the myocardial cell becomes acidotic uh, if you reduce the temperature uh, and then you have to have lots of buffers, but blood has its own buffers. So you needn't add extra from the outside. So probably that makes sense. And that is why the question of whether to use blood or not use blood uh, changed to how to use blood. So lots of uh, 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 devices and all that has come up. And you know, blood has got innate free radical scavenging mechanisms so that it helps a lot. And that is why it come up. And uh, you know, uh, blood, uh, 
uh, blood cardioplegia can be used at all the places except one when the patient has developed uh, cold agglutinins. This is actually a condition in which uh, when you uh, uh, reduce the temperature, then you may have certain uh, 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 means uh, the blood starts showing Raleigh formation in the smaller capillaries where perfusion flow is low, you find Raleigh formations and all that, that actually becomes a sludge and that is not uh, letting the perfusion occur. So whenever there are cold agglutinins, we always test the uh, patient's blood for cold agglutinin because we do not want to have survival, uh, surprises you see during the surgery. Once we had a surprise, when the, uh, uh, this, uh, our perfusionist uh, just uh, uh, started crying, he said that, look here, look at my circuit. You find Raleigh formation everywhere, right? Just, uh, it is like you are measuring in uh, sedimentation rate. So the sediments of uh, Raleigh's of RBCs were sitting in the filters, in the lines, in those chambers, right, in the circuit. So, and we got tested that yes, patient has uh, tested positive for cold agglutinins. So, uh, but we always do it. I, I don't know when, probably we, we didn't do it in the, uh, this uh, uh, COVID period because we were too much uh, overwhelmed with COVID. We were only looking at COVID that if he is positive is or negative, then probably things are all right. We forgot uh, testing agglutinin because that added to the cost. So, and we caught, we were caught on the wrong foot, you know. So uh, when there are cold agglutinins, then you, you refrain from using uh, sanguinous cardiopathy. So this is about crystalloid and uh, 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 blood, uh, how it came into myocardial preservation, cardioplegias. Then how we deliver these, uh, this is the commonest, the way we de deliver the St. Thomas solution. Uh, the, uh, they add two ml of uh, ampules, uh, two ml from the ampule of uh, concentrated St. Thomas solution per 100 ml of sanguineous solution at four to six degrees. Uh, this is the amount uh, usually uh, a perfusionists use. The root pressures, they always measure, they keep it at around 120 to 150. Beyond that, uh, uh, then really it makes uh, things jittery. It has to be taken into consideration what's happening. Most often it is the cannula, uh, uh, which may not be properly secured or it is jetting or uh, probably not properly placed in the aortic uh, uh, root. Uh, in pediatric age group, uh, aorta is, uh, well, aorta is uh, quite, uh, means uh, too much elastic, so uh, the, uh, sorry, plastic, and therefore the, uh, the pressures used are very much low, uh, as you see, uh, because you know that in the pediatric age group, smaller the kid, smaller the child, you need, uh, uh, means the, uh, the muscular tissue is less as compared to the, uh, 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 cells which are totally immature and they're not getting converted into plastic, uh, this elasticity. So plasticity is more, that is what uh, uh, results in uh, this uh, pressures. And it has to be repeated uh, every 20 minutes over a period of two to three minutes. Uh, uh, solutions, if you give 20 ml per kg, after 20 minutes, they reduce the dose by half, they make it 10. And then afterwards, if you keep on repeating, then you look at uh, the potassium concentration also on your blood gas strip. They are not creeping up. And accordingly, uh, you have to guide your perfusionist you know, how much potassium you have to keep in, the, uh, in this, uh, how much of the St. Thomas solution he has to mix up. So that is very important because at the end of the day, you do not want potassium to be extremely high uh, because uh, then you may have some more extra time that the heart may stay, uh, still may have arrhythmias. Now, uh, you must have heard sometimes something called the hot shot when cold crystalline hyperkalemic cardioplegic solution is given uh, for th three, four times, you take some extra time or when uh, the heart is poor to begin with as far as function is concerned or uh, your heart 
is already is having like uh, uh, hypertrophy or dilated cardiomyopathy is there or dilated heart is there, whatever may be the region, it may be the leaking heart, it may be uh, to begin with a, a part of cardiomyopathy, uh, poor LV function because of any reason uh, and uh, some bad surgery or the surgery that was difficult uh, in which uh, the pump time and cardioplegia time has gone up. You have to given, given lots of cardioplegia. Then uh, it was thought that uh, because you are giving uh, cold cardioplegia, you want things to come up to normal levels. You are uh, warming up the heart, uh, but uh, you don't want to start the mechanical activity because you saw that if you keep the heart quiet, right, and build up the enzymatic pathways inside that cell, make it normothermic, uh, means the uh, usage of uh, energy stores, uh, the glucose and the other gl glycogen glucagon, they are all being, they have been started being used. And then the ATP generation you want to occur, and then you hand over that cell to the mechanical activity. That makes sense, this way of functioning, right? So they said that, well, how we do it? If we open up the cross clamp straight away, then uh, you may see that uh, suddenly the potassium solution gets walled out, the extracellular broth in which the myocardial cells are lying bait, immersed, and uh, suddenly some part may start contracting, others may have uh, no contraction, there may be unusual pathways, lots of arrhythmias, and you may actually increase the amount of energy required at that point of time. And the, uh, 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 these uh, uh, chambers may swell up, right? So they said, no, we will not remove the cross clamp. What we do is the, you are already warming up the patient. We give, and supposing the time is there, we give a warm, right? Amino acid based, low potassium, right? Uh, blood uh, cardioplegia kind of thing. And then, you stay, you give it to the patient, uh, patient's heart through coronaries, and you wait for three, four minutes, and then you open the clamp. Probably by that time, ATs will get uh, uh, generated in those cells, and those cells will be better placed in actually uh, coping with this reperfusion which you have started. Uh, it works uh, uh, sometimes, and uh, I don't know, means. Uh, whatever literature says that it has worked, but uh, uh, many have seen that, well, nowadays we are using, uh, we have so much understanding of cardioplegia and myocardial preservation that uh, you may give or you may not give, uh, it doesn't make difference. But uh, habits take time to die. We still use uh, uh, amino acid solutions. We use uh, this salamine solution uh, with low potassium, with blood, four is to one, uh, given whenever these conditions are there, which I have enumerated, that is called the hot shot. Uh, again, blood versus uh, crystalloid, we have already talked. Blood has, we have talked the good uh, aspects of the blood, but there are certain bad aspects. And the thing is that like activation of macrophages, platelets and lymphocytes, because your patient is on the pump, you are using blood from the pump. And these macrophages, platelets and lymphocytes, they get activated. And you don't want that those uh, uh, to enter the heart. That is why, you know, when you do a heart transplantation, you don't use a blood, uh, uh, blood uh, uh, this custodial Burschneiser solution, you see. Uh, because uh, 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 one thing is that they may affect uh, the immunogenic cells and all that you don't want. You keep away the macrophages uh, out of it. You only use crystallite solutions there, right? Uh, so uh, that is very important. So the same thing can occur uh, in the same patient that uh, activated macrophages, and if they are making, they are making become a part of the sledge, uh, they could just get uh, activated and stick together and stay there, then they may actually increase the problems you see. So that can occur. Many a times you find the activation and uh, all those things are there, 
but still you are not able to actually uh, your uh, uh, your heart is the heart of the patient it still becomes low cardiac output syndrome in the post operative period so there is a play of macrophages activated platelets also uh, inside the coronaries in which you have given blood cardiopathy uh, plasma components are there those uh, those things they actually they are helping out and as i said that we don't use it in cold agglutinins well another solution is burst nitrous solution it is also used you can see here that uh, potassium is uh, magnesium sodium tryptophan ketoglutarate these are the substances right which are actually uh, result in increased atp uh, generation the precursors for that right and uh, certain histidine buffer and all that they are used uh one of the custodial solution uh, the uh, uh, which is used for uh, this uh, uh, heart transplant uh, uh, means the donor uh, heart uh, preservation you must have heard lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, noise about delido what is what is what is actually delido and they have said actually it came up in last two three uh, in the last uh, three decades Uh, very much in pediatric uh, age group uh, uh, for this one they use plasma light uh, a which is very near to the plasma uh, oncotic pressures are good right and they have used mannitol magnesium sodium and potassium right lidocaine uh, but here you see instead of uh, one four is to one the situation is one is to four so more crystalloid less blood Uh, so you don't want uh, too much of activation of uh, uh, mega karyocytes platelets uh, lymphocytes uh, 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 straight uh, infusion inside so probably they say that uh, the better outcome is uh, there and uh, you because you have to cool the heart also so it may uh, stay for a longer time means for at least for uh 90 90 minutes uh, 80 to 90 minutes if you uh, give uh, uh, in the first dose so you needn't give uh, uh, repeat the doses and uh, that's why you can save some time and also uh, your patient uh, because when you when you give uh, uh, the uh, the uh, repeat the dose then actually you are changing the extracellular uh, uh Uh, composition uh, right and so uh, at some time there may not be means less potassium and then you build up the potassium they say that that can also result in various islands of uh, low potassium high potassium so it becomes very difficult for the cells to uh, figure out properly what's happening and to work in unison another thing was people said that well why we uh, if it is available in an ample 10 ml of st thomas solution why you want to put it into a solution another solution make it and you use it why can't we straight away use an ample into the blood and just uh, give it like that uh, well that is called microplegia uh, it uh, reduce the volume and all prevent hemo dilution and cellular edema Uh, but somehow uh, uh, means uh, because uh, probably surgeons were asked to give microplegia at their level uh, so uh, somehow it didn't uh, click too much too often uh, we have never used it so uh, clinical experience we have very little and uh, we don't know about uh, how it works uh, so uh, that is there uh, then another component of myocardial preservation is of course hypothermia the question is hypothermia is it good or bad we still don't know if you become hypothermic 1 degree down uh, your temperature you will be your uh, jaws will be chattering like anything your oxygen demand goes up so that kind of thing hypothermia as such is detrimental you see there's so many problems right enzyme function membrane stability calcium sequestration occurs uh it is reduced adenosine triphosphate generation is reduced uh tissue oxygen uptake is reduced regulation hydrogen ion is everything is getting affected by hypothermia right uh but then why it is good when you know, why we make everybody uh, uh, preservation means slightly making hypothermic or in, you must have uh, read about uh, 
that uh, uh, post arrest uh, you make the person hypothermic. Well, you do it for the brain and other like that is to uh, let the cells uh, become all right. But what is there? Well, I'll tell you. See, there are two pathways in the cells. Remember, AKT pathways, it is a protein kinase B activation, right? What happens that hypothermia, all right, it actually, the activity of this sodium po uh, potassium pump, which is ubiquitous, it is available in all the cells. You name the cells, this pump is there. One of the earliest pump to actually start functioning in the cells. When the cells started joining up and making more complex uh, 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 beings, actually these pumps were a phenomenal function is required, right? It's practically abolished, you see, hypothermia, right? So, uh, but it conserves ATP, you know? So ATP, what does it do? That it actually keeps these AKTs. These are actually protein kinase B. The, this AKT, the name is called AKT, right? It, the AKT is, T is actually thymoma, and AK has come from a mouse, you see? So actually, these are certain genes which have been seen, and those genes are also found, which are taking a very prominent role in apoptosis and cell necrosis, right? Those pathways. So that is what's actually uh, uh, inactivation of these proteins, this results in, AKT pathway results in inactivation of caspase 3 and box-based proteins, which are, which are very instrumental, right? In actually apoptosis and cell death. So they result in increasing in cell cell death. So one phenomenon is this, another is ERK1 and 2. So these are actually extracellular signal regulated kinases, right? And they get affected right? Diminish this activation after hypothermia. It results in lower COX-2 expression. Now this expression, this is uh, actually cyclooxygenase. So what happens that this results in uh, 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 COX-2 results in one of the isoforms of this one, it results in the maximum ischemic reperfusion injury. So these are the two pathways, e e AKT pathway and ERK one and two pathway, you see, these are acting uh, in, during hypothermia, they are working the maximum. And you remember that, that this is how hypothermia happens, right? But not extreme hypothermia, because then even these pathways, they actually stop function. So you don't get any benefit out of it, right? So that was about hypothermia, and various kinds of deliveries, you see, anti-grade, direct osteal, retrograde, through vein grafts, simultaneous anti-grade retrograde, and intra-atrial also. We are not able to do anything, uh, means you are not able to put a cannula inside the coronal sinus, then you actually make this atria as a chamber and uh, fill it up. So that will also go. People have tried uh, that. Few pictures, uh, uh, you can see here, these are the anti-grade cannula. Here is how you have a separate circuit. The anti-grade cardiophagia is delivered in the root. A uh, few of our patients, you see, this is the separate circuit where you can actually change the temperature, you can mix up, uh, and this is how it is delivered into the root. Yes, you remember the first point I said, quick arrest. Now, quick arrest, how we do it, we use adenosine. You know, adenosine, actually, what does it cause? It doesn't cause depolarization. It causes hyperpolarization. So, and uh, immediate arrest occurs. So we give uh, adenosine uh, before starting the uh, hyperkalemic uh, uh, cardioplegic solution. So this is how, this is the cannula. Here we give uh, six milligrams of adenosine. It is immediately injected and followed by uh, uh, the blood cardio, hyperkalemic blood from the pump, you see. So it immediately causes uh, arrest. It has two functions. If uh, this adenosine works on A1, adenosinic, adenogenic, uh, this adenosine A1 receptors and A2 receptors, A2 work on the vascular smooth muscles of the coronary arteries in which they increase the CMP and cause a relaxation. So even distribution of cardioplegia. And second thing via 
adenosine, uh, adenosine A1 receptors, it actually reduces CAMP and it causes reduction in rate at both sinus and the uh, AV node. And also that there is enormous delay and the stoppage. So what happens, it actually ultimately what it causes, it immediate arrest, it happens and that actually preserves your ATPs. Otherwise, many a times you will find that the heart keeps on chugging. You keep on giving unless it properly distributes throughout the myocardium. Then only complete arrest occurs. It may take minutes, you know, three, four minutes. And at that time, because everything is changing, right? The, uh, the myocardial cell is using ATPs. It is, it is stopped generating because it is hypothermic at around uh, four to six degrees centigrade, right? Whatever ATPs were there in the stock that is being used and when ultimately heart stops, it stops at a nadir of the uh, supply of ATPs. Now imagine when it will waken up and you have not given hot shot, there will be minimum ATPs at that point of time and heart will struggle. Uh, direct coronary osteal retrograde uh, approach. You see, these are the cannulae. Remember, they can cause osteal injury. They can cause coronary artery dissection, right? And when, supposing you use uh, a V uh, valve, uh, a, this aortic valve, sorry, then uh, accessibility afterwards uh, may become sometimes difficult because of the angulation of these cannulae and those coronary ostea are actually uh, behind the uh, a sewing ring of the valve, so it becomes very difficult. Half of it leaks, you see. Uh, if you have placed vein graft for the coronary artery bypass surgery, then you can use this kind of octopus. This is added to the circuit from the pump and you connect these to various uh, uh, vein grafts. The other important thing is the retrograde uh, cardiopagia. You know, the, through the coronary sinus in this cartoon, you can look here that the coronary sinus, this is the opening into the uh, right atrium, <coughs> sorry. And this coronary sinus is actually built up by the great cardiac vein, the various kind of intermediate veins, middle uh, 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 cardiac vein and all that. And these combine and they actually open up this. So if you put up a candle here and give into the this uh, venous side of this, then you can actually perfuse the heart, right? It makes sense, but there are problems. What are the problems? That it is the venous side, so you have to keep the pressures really low. Now, this is the coronary sinus here. This is the T, uh, you can actually use a T-guided uh, cannula insertion. Uh, in this, uh, uh, you can see here, this is the coronary sinus here. This is the basal four chamber view rotated on the right side. Uh, you can open up the coronary sinus. And when the surgeon goes in, you can say, and always remember before actually emptying the heart, you have to place this cannula. Otherwise you have to open up the right atrium and then you have to place under direct vision if you want to place it. Uh, retrograde cannula, many companies are building up. They, uh, there may be a, a self inflating balloon or uh, in, inflated by the surgeon. Then there is a solid port by which you can actually measure the pressure because pressure is of paramount importance. Uh, you cannot infuse uh, at higher pressures. You see, that is how it goes in. And you can very well see here that the right-sided uh, preservation is rather uh, less as compared to the left-sided because of the Thebaisian veins. I have brought a picture of Thebaisian veins. You can see here, this is the vein opens up into sinusoid and these sinusoids are actually opening directly into the lumen. So these are the Thebaisian vein and on the right side of the heart, uh, enormous Thebaisian veins and these sinusoids are there. So you don't know how much is leaking and it is not preserving it well. So that kind of thing is there. So it is not only retrograde, you have to uh, go along with anti-grade. So anti-grade, retrograde together, that makes sense. Uh, pressure is around 25 millimeters of mercury, volume around 150 to 200 per minute, right? And continuously you have to monitor the pressure trace because there are chances that it may leak out. So one has to be very careful. And the, if the percussionist is monitoring the pressure, 
then actually it can sync with the pump uh, uh, rotations. So if you are not using, uh, means if you are using this roller pump. So uh, if there is a sync on his monitor panel, then he'll actually, he knows that it is delivering well and there is no leak. Uh, and always remember that if there is a LSVC, means left-sided uh, SVC or superior vena cava, then you don't use uh, retrograde cardioplegia because uh, many a times it, it is a surprise when you look into, uh, then you can actually find uh, that the, you have to do a bubble like, uh, like I'm doing uh, uh, to actually look at whether it has a connectivity from the right side or not. Uh, I'm injecting on the right side and it is getting uh, uh, connected that way. So, uh, and also uh, you can very well see here that uh, this is on the transthoracic echo and this is on the transesophageal echo that how this LSVC looks. Now, uh, uh, so retrograde alone is not good it, along with the anti-grade, right? It is uh, very good. If you see here, uh, this is one of the very good papers and they have given uh, retrograde cardioplegia and they have uh, watched by looking at the longitudinal strain uh, of the uh, left-sided uh, left sided strain. Uh, when you, they look at the overall, then they found nearly the same. When they split it into integrated cardioplegia, means longitudinal versus uh, this antigrade versus retrograde, or only multiple antigrade cardioplegia, you can very well see here that even if the uh, uh, LV was bad, means the less uh, strain, post-preservational, uh, the strain was very good when they have used integrated cardiophagia. But if you have your heart has good strain, good functionality, and if you only use multiple integrated cardiophagia, then actually there is a reduction in the post-operative period. So means to say that integrate uh, and retrograde together means you use both of them. Uh, retrograde as a continuous low flow and uh, interspersed with anti-grade cardiophagia, as I told you in the beginning. So that uh, makes sense and it is better. Now, I'll, finally, I'll just uh, talk uh, uh, for uh, just a few slides, reperfusion, because you say you are ready to come off uh, you, uh, and you clam uh, all our deal is over, you have preserved your heart well, clamp has to be removed, there was, it was all a smooth sailing. You remove the clamp, you find that uh, suddenly the heart has picked up, but uh, it has picked up well, but after two, three uh, minutes, you find if you start thinking of coming off the bypass, then the heart is not taking the load. Uh, it is succumbing and you have to go back to the pump, support it further and all. And you come off with low cardiac output syndrome. What has happened? Well, uh, well, it is actually the reperfusion phenomena. Means if you cause ischemia for some time and then you reperfuse with blood, uh, you think that things will be all right, but the cells at the cellular level, things are not all right. Uh, there may be post-perfusion arrhythmias, LV dysfunction, uh, low output syndrome, and even cardiac arrest sometimes, right? And you know that, uh, well, uh, means uh, it may be visible in your ICU, patient may stay for some quite some time, may need lots of cardiotonic drugs, may need other kind of support like uh, uh, balloon uh, and all that, but you know, patient may go home, but still uh, patient may be in reperfusion problems and that may stay for a month, right? That is there. It is all actually because of this oxygen and calcium, these two uh, things, they are good for the survival, but that is also bad. When you deprive the cell, don't give anything of oxygen, any oxygen or calcium, and then you suddenly give them, then the problem occurs. That you must have seen in the revascularization means coronary artery bypass surgery, you open up the graft and suddenly you find there, in a, there is an episode of arrhythmia. So this is actually the reperfusion phenomena. And that is why we always uh, look at the uh, means the angiogram ourselves, you know, to know if there is a collateralization or not, if there are collaterals or not. If there are no collaterals, then always remember, neat and graphs. It may look good, but 
reperfusion injury will be more because there is no collateralized. You don't find uh, much of blood in those uh, areas of the LV. So once the grafts are placed, it is all reperfusion. So quickly, uh, what is oxygen paradox? You see, this is one of the wonderful papers in the molecular medicine. We read it a lot, we read it a lot and uh, it gives us that why is this only, I begin from here. Forget ischemia means uh, you have done all the problems with the sin. Xanthine oxidase, once it works on hypoxanthine, right? And you add oxygen when reperfusion occurs, then there is a deluge of superoxides, right? And hydrogen peroxide is generated and these hydroxyl uh, radicals are in. They are very active species. So oxygen is causing the problem. There is enormous, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, lots of, uh, means uh, a plasticity uh, creeps in, means they become uh, a kind of hibernation. They go in hibernation. So hibernating means they become stiff. They are not actually contracting. A contracture has developed. That kind of thing can occur. And there may be uh, cell death also, right? The other thing is the calcium. What happens? So, right, you open the uh, cross clamp. You have your up till now, your uh, cardioplegia has very little calcium. You open it up. Now there is enormous calcium all around in the uh, extracellular compartment. You have given some calcium. This calcium will result in calcium induced calcium release. It means there will be uh, going inside the cell through these. Uh, 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 channels which are called the L-type channels and also from the sarcoplasmic reticulum there is a deleve. So you find immediate suddenly more of calcium. Now imagine if during your procedure if you your cell is uh, taking in slow calcium through the window channels there is already a lots of calcium inside. Lots of calcium goes from here Lots of calcium now enters from these orange L-type calcium channels. There is enormous calcium inside. And that immediately results in effects on your uh, myocardium and the myocardial pores, right? Affecting into the injuries. So basically what is happening is this cytosolic calcium and reactive species, oxygen species that I showed you, that actually activates this myocardial permeability transition, right? This is actually a pore. So this is actually reperfusion is a mitochondrial injury, right? Those warehouses, those powerhouses where energy is being created for the cell uh, to maintain its structural activity and also the functional activity, that those powerhouses are being bombed. So that is what's happening. So cytosolic free calcium and these, they are doing that, right? And that is why this actually results in no formation of AT and in fact, initiation of cell death apoptosis, right? Now I'll show you, right? What happens, supposing when you find that actually your uh, myocardium has met it, you just from today, you go and you, when you do your TE, and you look at these, uh, these transgastric uh, metapillary views, interventricular septum and its function, you see, if you find the symptom is not working well, and these kind of minuscule lighthouses, as if these are the Deepavali lights, you see, adorning looks good, but actually these are the areas where they have actually taken the maximum assault from the in reperfusion phenomena, right? And these are the particular uh, necrotic and hemorrhagic areas where the cell has died. So these are, these are the markers. They may stay for quite some time and the uh, heart will struggle till uh, actually the normal cells take over, right? So this is the message marker. This is my last slide. Uh, still, we use lots of propofol. Our practice is totally propofol based. And you know that uh, inhalational anesthetic agents, they can actually help out. And the propofol also helps out. And actually they affect what? The mitochondrial permeability transition. So the effect on the pores. So do, don't let them open up. Load, let, they don't let the mitochondria die. So that is about a reperfusion phenomena. Okay, so probably now we understand 
that why we use what we use now as far as these uh, cardiac, uh, 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 these things are there and why it is happening uh, that way. So uh, I hope I'm able to uh, take you along the uh, cellular mechanism of the uh, myocardial preservation, okay? And you will not, uh, it will not become a burden for you to understand, right? Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you to Rahul for giving me a chance. Uh, I'm sorry I'll not be available for the second session uh, because of uh, my own institutional activity. You see, they have put up a uh, directors, you know, they just uh, take our uh, uh, Saturdays also sometimes and we can't say no. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for this absolutely comprehensive presentation. And I don't think the students will need anything else beyond this uh, to, uh, to approach this particular topic. Now, students, uh, we are deeply honored to have Sir among us. Uh, and protecting the heart is a principal practice that we cardiac anesthesiologists do. So if you have any questions, any doubt, please ask Sir at this point. And also you can email me. Uh... Email me and uh, uh, and also you can give me a ring. <laughs> Thank <laughs> and, you so uh, much, sir. Yes, Thank uh, you. I'm always open. You know, I love teaching. <laughs> Thank you. Students, any questions, any doubts? This is the time because we will not come back to this very important topic in the next one and a half years. So uh, uh, please ask any questions if you have to, sir. Okay, sir. It seems like, okay. as always, it's a pin drop silence. So, <laughs> are they sleeping? Maybe <laughs> no. four o'clock is a sleeping. <laughs> time. Uh, uh, <laughs> How many are there? How many are there? Actually, we had a very good attendance today, sir. Other than our regular FACTA candidates, a few other students from uh, different courses have also joined. Okay, okay. So, okay. Uh, we are very happy with the attendance. I think um, somebody can tell, Mister, it was not too boring. The talk because I need feedback. Uh, teacher Students, also need feedback. Somebody can say that were you uh, whether I was able to uh, sort out these uh, the basic uh, principle of uh, myocardial uh, protection, or it was too difficult. Uh, Ritoban, Gargi, uh, Tejoshvini, Ashwant. Come out, tell sir, how did you feel about the presentation? It's all right, sir, we'll yes, be an examiner, we know. Yes, your feedback is very important. I must be evaluated. Or send uh, it to Rahul. <laughs> <laughs> Our students don't speak. That's the point, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a big point, sir. And, yes. uh, in England, if you uh, were there, uh, you know, Rahul, in England, uh, I was FRCA cardiac anesthesia module teacher in uh, Midland. Yes. And my teachings were very famous. Why? Because we started on Saturday evening and uh, worked throughout the night till Sunday morning. And we used to cook and they used to bring uh, cutlery along with them because I don't have many plates and cutlery with me. Uh, and I used to cook Indian food for them. And it was a question answer sessions, right? Means uh, we used to, <laughs> we used to, uh, they used to ask me and I used to answer. Uh, and I used to explain, right, uh, on, on board and chalk and all that. <laughs> Fantastic. And you also used to feed them too. So yes, yes, yes. They had everything. They just brought, uh, they just brought good wine along with them and plates and cutlery. Otherwise, I said you have to eat with the, either straight from the uh, means from that uh, wok in which I cook food. You see, <laughs> fantastic, sir. Okay, thank you uh, very thank much, you. Sir. Rahul. I'll thank take you. the leave. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah, yeah. Ashwant, you might start uh, uh, sharing your screen for the second part. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
you can start. Reading, uh, my topic today is pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics of anesthetic drugs in the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. So, so just then, the uh, basic thing of pharmacokinetics defines process through which a drug is handled once it's introduced into the body. That's basically what the body does to the drug. And pharmacodynamics describes how the uh, drug interacts with the body to produce the changes as the drug is in the patient physiology. So, interaction, uh, CPB uh, affects the pharmacodynamics pharmacokinetics of the drugs and insulation of uh, CPB profound effects uh, are seen because of the uh, plasma concentration, distribution of the drugs and elimination of the administered drugs. So the, these are the factors responsible for during CPB. Uh, one is the hemodilution, altered plasma protein binding, hypotension, hypothermia, pulsatile versus non-pulsatile flow and isolation of lungs from uh, circulation and uptake of drugs by the uh, circuit. So first, let's say about hemodilution. Uh, CBP usually primed with priming fluid, uh, either mixed with blood or uh, plasma light, as just seen uh, now. And priming volume is uh, b around 1.5 liters to 2 liters. Uh, the priming fluid either, either can be crystalloid or crystalloid with blood or can be colloid. Uh, hemodilation results in decrease in hematocrit about 25 percentage and increase in plasma volume by 40 to 50 percentage. Uh, this decreases total blood con uh, concentration of any free drug in the blood. The reduction level of circulating proteins like the albumin and alpha-1 glycoproteins are also seen, which leads to affix protein binding of the drugs and alteration in bound, of, bound to free uh, drug fraction in the circulation. So re, uh, this can be uh, uh, reduced by using a retrograde autologous priming and low CPB circuit. So plasma drug concentration reduced without any change in the amount of the drug in the body. Uh, volume of distribution uh, increases acutely. Uh, drug redistribution occurs to bring equilibrium between tissue and plasma. The total drug concentration may give a misleading information uh, on effect change in the drug effect. Heparin is an effect on measurement of drug protein binding because uh, it uh, releases lipoprotein lipase and hepatic lipases, uh, which causes uh, conversion of triglycerides to non necessary fatty acids and also has a, a, a competitive binding on albumin. Uh, this further reduces the protein binding of the drugs. Um, but that's also caused marked change in acid-based balance, uh, which has an effect on the ionized and non-ionized fraction of the drug, and also change in pH is uh, so. so the change in pH is managed using a pH stat or the blood gas stat uh, routinely. The next is hypothermia. Hypothermia commonly used and reduces hepatic and renal enzymes functions, and should also shift the intravascular fluid to the interstitial space. Uh, thereby reducing the pre plasma fractions and activates autonomic and endocrine reflexes also, which causes vasoconstriction and decreases the volume of distribution. Uh, it also uh, depresses metabolism by inhibiting enzyme function and reduces tissue perfusion by increasing blood viscosity. It also causes altered drug excretion because of the renal, uh, reduced uh, renal blood flow, reduced glomerular filtration, and also tuberous secretions. The GFRs decreased by about 65% at uh, 25 degrees a year, which is the study seen in a dogs. The kinetics by seen in hypothermia, where peripheral vasoconstriction may decrease absorption of drugs uh, other, uh, like other than in, uh, intravenous routes, and uh, fluid extravasation alters the volume of distribution. Vasoconstriction reduces the rate of uptake of drugs from peripheral to the central compartment. Reduction in enzyme by transformation uh, may decrease clearance of drugs and increases the elimination half time. Increase, they also increases blood solubility in blood of volatile anesthetics as well. Sequestration, come next sequestration. Uh, sequestration drugs may be taken up by various components of the circuit, most commonly seen in the oxygenator part. These oxygenators have been reported uh, to bind drugs in vitro. And when normothermia is re-established, uh, reperfusion of tissues may lead to wash of the drug, which has been sequestered either in the uh, oxygenators or in the circuit uh, during hypothermia. So this leads to increased uh, drug fraction in the, to the body. In vitro, various oxygenators bind lipophilic uh, agents such as volatile agents, propofol, opioids, and barbiturates. In vivo, any drug removed by the circuit is replaced from a larger uh, tissue reservoir. During uh, CPB, lungs are isolated from circulation which acts as a survey or a reservoir bag uh, for the drugs. So once on reperfusion, uh, re-ventilation, uh, the drugs uh, 
uh, more drugs, a fraction of drugs are available for the uh, body. So basic drugs like lidocaine, prop prop propanolol, and fentanyl are sequestered uh, during uh, CPB and are released during rewarming. This affects transient and counterbalance by increasing in plasma-free drug concentration used by reduced protein binding. Next, we'll see about blood flow. Hepatic, renal, cerebral, and skeletal percussion is reduced during CPB. So the alteration in regional blood flow distribution have implications for drug distribution metabolism. CPB may be connected with either with the pulsatile or non-pulsatile flow. And non-pulsatile flow is associated with the altered tissue perfusion. Uh, non-pulsatile and decreased peripheral perfusion leads to cellular hypoxia, which uh, causes uh, acidosis. And uh, acidosis again causes the fraction of ionized and non-ionized drugs to be altered. On reperfusion, there will be redistribution as a systemic plasma concentration because basic drugs have been trapped in the acidic tissue. Another factor is age. Aging associated with a variety of physiological changes. The function of the heart is decreased thereby the reduced perfusion to distal organs and thereby leading to reduced uh, clearance. Elderly people have increased adipose tissue and decreased albumin. And uh, they have the reservoir for lipid soluble drugs and higher free drug uh, concentration. Uh, hence in elderly on CPB, reduction in doses to limit the high free drug concentration and to prevent toxic effect is uh, warranted. But in infants or in children, the distribution of body fat and clearance differs. Hence the dosing for the infants and children are different. Specific agents we see now, uh, opioids total, total concentration decreases on initial, initiation of a CPP. Fentanyl has a degree of decrease is greater, adheres to the surface of the circuit and has a high first pass uptake by the lungs. Hence, they're sequestered in lungs and uh, reperfusion, there are high, on reperfusion, there are high concentration. The drug concentration is the least to the drug having at the high volume of distribution. So fentanyl is the most stable drug concentration. Free alfentanyl uh, concentration, uh, there are, they are relatively stable and pharmacologically active drug remains unchanged. Elimination of fentanyl and alfentanyl is prolonged. And elimination of morphine remains unchanged. In benzodiazepines, uh, most than 90% of the drugs are bound to protein. So hence, change in free concentration influenced by changes in protein concentration or factors affecting protein binding influences greatly on uh, benzodiazepines. Diazepam has a long elimination half-life, hence they uh, become cumulative in CPP and has an even more longer duration on rewarming. Uh, Midazolam is a shorter elimination type, uh, but increases with the age and in CPP. Uh, but, but when compared to other diazepam, lorazepam, midazolam still has a better half-life than the uh, other diazepams. And midazolam half-life unchanged in CPP, but still has a higher, uh, longer elimination than midazolam. Intravenous anesthetic agents, the total drug concentration of thiopentone and methoxidol decreases on commencing CPB, but the active free drug concentration remains stable. Time and clearance ha is halved on commencement of uh, CPB, but elimination rate is unknown for now. The total concentration of propofol decreases on start of CPB with an increase in free fraction. The redistribution half-life was short uh, with the drop in concentration of stopping the drug. So there is rapid recovery on rewarming. On coming world health anesthetics, effect on CPB on MAC remains uncertain. Certain studies have shown that enflurane uh, MAC reduces by about 30 percentage. Uh, and uh, uh, factors depends on three factors. One is blood gas solubility and opposing uh, effect of cooling uh, hypothermia uh, in uh, decreasing blood gas solubility of blood uh, and also increased solubility in tissue due to hypothermia and uptake by the oxygenator. So lipid concentration, osmolarity, and hematocrate alter the solubility of the agent. Blood gas partition coefficient depends on the priming, prime used and the temperature. Agents combine to various types of plastics, hence there is decrease in concentration and commencement of CPB. Agents started during hypothermic uh, CPB as uh, takes longer time to equilibrate, thereby uh, causing change in depth of anesthesia. Because of lower metabolism and faster washout, there is duration of action is shorter. Neuromuscular blockers, the requirement of neuromuscular blockers greatly is reduced. Cooling causes the decreased nerve condition and also causes decreased acetyl coil mobilization from, nerve, uh, from the nerve vesicles and modifies the cholinergic receptors as well. Since they affect uh, cholinesterase activity also. Uh, cooling alters mechanical properties of the muscles and affects on electrolytes. Uh, causing a decreased contractile response. 
hemodilation uh, uh, there will be initial decrease in the free drug uh, concentration although albumin concentration also decreases uh, there will be free drug concentration is increased if partially bound to albumin and uh, profoundly seen in uh, with rocronium hypo hypothermia inhibits hepatic clearance of steroidal neuromuscular blockers but promote renal clearance and steroidal neuromuscular blockers like rocronium and vecronium are prolonged than agents depending on clear uh, renal clearance and hypothermia to summarize uh, so pharmacokinetic process like absorption when there is hypotension and alteration region blood flow or perfusion the pharmacokinetic act uh, pharmacokinetic sequence like reduce or or intramuscular absorption and by distribution wise the uh, lung sequestration decrease pulmonary blood flow seen hypotension altered blood flow decrease protein binding these causes decrease in volume of distribution decrease pulmonary drug uh, distribution increase systemic uh, drug levels and decrease volume of distribution and also causes increase volume of distribution when there is decrease protein binding uh, hemodilution dilution of uh, uh, protein binding and post operative increase alpha 1 glycoproteins and post operative increase in protein binding causes decrease volume of distribution and interpretation of post operative drug levels will be difficult elimination wise there when there is decrease hepatic blood flow there is decrease drug clearance and hypothermia causes decrease intrinsic uh, clearance is because of decrease hepatic metabolism decrease re renal blood flow and hypothermia causes re decrease renal functions and decrease uh, clearance and elimination uh okay ashant i mean uh, you have covered more or less everything now uh, it is a, it is a dry topic why because uh, the effect of cardiopulmonary bypass on the pharmacology of the drugs that we use uh, during cardiopulmonary bypass uh, is determined by several factors as you mentioned uh, um, the the change in the unbound fraction of the intravenous and the inhalational agents uh, hemodilution hypothermia Uh, sequestration yes. there are so many things happening at the same time that how it all adds together to give the clinical picture uh, and the practical aspects of drug management remain very unclear as of today okay. that is why it 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 essentially remains a very theoretical kind of topic having said that it is it is important that we know it because it comes in the theory papers uh, it is often asked in the viva and in general and cardio uh, cardiac anesthesiology should know how drugs uh, can behave uh, on the cardiopulmonary bypass so to summarize essentially the two most important points are that the moment a patient goes on cardiopulmonary bypass due to the effect of the prime there is hemodilution and uh, this hemodilution leads to decrease in the concentration of the active drug and the second most important factor is the uh, decrease in the concentration of the essential proteins which bind to certain drugs which are mainly albumin alpha 1 um, uh, glyco acid glycoprotein and the red blood cells also uh, a lot of our anesthetic drugs also attach to the rbc so all of this get diluted uh, leading to a change in the drug concentration in the patient's blood now the only thing that i want to mention here is that Uh, many of our cardiac surgical patients either might be critically ill or might be frail critically ill in the sense that many of them are heart failure patients so they are very sick uh, or they are frail uh, again it might be due to cardiac cachexia related malnutrition and all these things uh, the important point here being the hypoalbuminemia that happens in all of these patients and uh, drugs like propofol midazolam and our opioids very avidly bind to albumin so they have a very important implication all these three drugs have very important implications uh, when we are uh, having 
very critically ill patients, heart failure patients, and frail patients with hypoalbuminemia. This is one point that I would like to stress upon. The other thing that you might have mentioned I have missed is the role of heparin. Uh, we use high doses of heparin on cardiopulmonary bypass. Now, heparin hydrolyzes the triglycerides into uh, the fatty acids, which competitively bind with the uh, with albumin, thereby displacing many of these drugs. So again, heparin has an effect on uh, the free drug concentration. Uh, that is again very important, and all of us need to understand these. Uh, when uh, and we also need to remember that when we reverse heparin with protamin, again the concentration of the drugs. Uh, come back to the same level as the pre-heparin concentration. Now, the other thing that you did not uh, or, or just about mentioned is the, uh, can everybody mute, please? Uh, Manoj, can you mute uh, everybody? It's a lot of noise coming. And Ashwant, you can stop sharing your screen. Uh, thank you. And uh, so the other thing that is uh, very important is the uh, minimal cardiopulmonary bypass, as we say. Uh, so uh, shorter CPB circuits uh, will again lead to less use of prime and thus uh, causing less effect on our free drug concentrations. That is another thing that I wanted to tell you. This uh, using of a smaller bypass circuit are technically known as the minimal extracorporeal circulation. However, since these machines have come very lately, uh, not many randomized control trials have been done to see whether they actively change the drug concentration uh, during CPV. So those are certain areas where future research projects, uh, thesis projects can even be done, uh, although they will be very costly projects because you have to measure the drug concentrations. Uh, you have to collect the blood on CPV, then you have to, uh, you have to uh, keep them at the right temperature and shift them to the laboratory under proper storage conditions so that uh, these things become very important. But this, that's a very interesting area where we can look into. Uh, the other thing that I want to tell you is that there are many drugs like propofol and fentanyl, which have a very high volume of distribution. That means they intrinsically have the ability to uh, distribute themselves into a large volume of tissues and extracellular fluid. So for them, the, the role of the um, uh, proteins like albumin and the alpha-1 acid glycoprotein and hemodilution might have a lesser effect than the uh, drugs. Uh, you have mentioned about hypothermia. Uh, please remember that Hoffman elimination, uh, which is essentially uh, involved in the metabolism of atracurium and cisatracurium, uh, decreases during hypothermia. So uh, all neuromuscular blocking agent potency actually increases in hypothermia. That has to be kept in mind. Uh, the lung blood flow is almost always stopped during CPB. Uh, uh, except for some bronchial arterial flow, which comes. Uh, so there are certain uh, there are certain drugs like propofol and uh, uh, opioids and neuromuscular blockers, mainly opioids and muscle relaxants, uh, which are very avidly sequestered to the pulmonary circulation. So the problem is that as soon as we remove the clamp and reestablish the pulmonary blood flow, all of this sequestered uh, muscle relaxants and the fentanyl that we have given will come back to the circulation and that will have an implication on the post uh, bypass period. That has to be remembered. Uh, uh, many of this, uh, the CPB circuits have plastic components and uh, uh, opioids, propofols and inhalational agents. All of them bind to these plastic components. They might even damage. There have been reports that plastic components have been damaged. So that is also another thing which, uh, which can decrease the concentration of the active drug. And uh, again, here, the minimal extracorporeal circulation circuit, uh, that means the smaller CPB circuits might have a good role, uh, but we are not yet sure because the evidence-based research is yet to come. And finally, you must have told about the systemic inflammatory response, which causes reduced uh, liver and brain drug clearance because of dysregulation of enzyme systems. 
uh, all kinds of pump runs have some element of surge to it. So obviously, again, the free drug concentration will increase uh, due to the effect of this uh, surge on CPB. So there are about eight, nine factors uh, which affect drug concentration on CPB and how all these add up together uh, to give the final clinical picture, uh, to be very honest, is still very unclear, but we all must know the theoretical aspects of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics on cardiopulmonary bypass. Yeah. Okay, Ashwan, so uh, that is all. It's a, it's a small topic, but uh, it's a very dense topic. Um, and all of you should keep, uh, this presentation will be there in our IACTA YouTube channel. So you can go back and listen to it before your exams, but it is preferable that you, uh, you keep a small note on this topic, uh, which you can refer to before you go to the exam, because it is not very conceptual. It needs a little bit of memorizing, uh, so that you can attempt the questions. Okay. Yes. So thanks to all of you. You have any questions here? If any of you have any questions, I can take those. Uh, but otherwise, I think uh, we have covered most of the aspects of uh, PK and PD on cardiopulmonary bypass.